Hello, and welcome to the Fast Cat Podcast. My name is Andrew Jeanette. I'm a coach here at Fast Cat Coaching. And starting with today's episode, I'll be doing a monthly series digging into what the most current scientific research says on various coaching topics. In addition to presenting my interpretation of the research, I'll be bringing on an expert guest to help clarify and further our understanding. But before we jump in, uh, I have a couple of announcements. The first of which is our Zwift integration is large and in charge. We also have a Ruby integration. And on the Ruby site, you'll go to workouts and just authorize your CoachCat credentials and you'll be good to go. We have a special going on right now. Our 50% off CoachCat sale continues but expires December 2nd. You can save 50% when you commit to your training for the year. And athletes improve their FTP by as much as 30% in their first year. And we have our review of the week, which comes to us from Chan Stevens, who says, I frittered away the past year not following any single specific plan, but dabbling in multiple platforms and multiple wearables, gauging which one gets me. And it would be best to be able to help me reach my goals. That year of frittering has convinced me FastCat is the best at both the creating and managing of the plan and the one of the very few that can also recognize and react in day-to-day, real-time, any changes warranted by how well I'm actually recovering. I'll still use a companion like Zwift or Ruby to execute the workouts in the plan, but can't recommend the CoachCat bot highly enough. And so back to the podcast... On today's episode, my guest is Alex Winnicky, a registered dietitian and board certified specialist in sports dietetics. If you couldn't guess from his credentials, we'll be discussing how to optimize your nutrition and we'll be giving special attention to cycling's favorite macronutrient, carbohydrate. And so without further ado, we welcome our guest, Alex. Alex, how's it going? Going well. Good. Man. Yeah, good to see you. Um, So if you wouldn't mind, can you tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and and what you do? Absolutely. Uh, So as you mentioned, uh, I'm a registered dietitian and specialized in sports dietetics, uh, but specifically uh, endurance and eating disorder. Uh, So for the past three years, I've actually worked in the NCAA uh, at Northwestern University. I also serve as the director of Olympic sports nutrition at Liberty University. Um, I've since left Liberty uh, probably about this time last year uh, and since I've moved to Greenville, South Carolina, uh, where I have started up my own business, Second Aero Nutrition Consulting. And so now my full-time gig is essentially seeing athletes anywhere from middle school into retirement. Um, I see all sorts of different athletes from some team sports still, but quite a few triathletes. Um, I work with some elite development mountain bike teams, some different triathlete coaching groups, and uh, even consult with a couple of D2, D3 colleges here in upstate South Carolina. So um, outside of that, I've got a little bit of a a background in road racing as well, which kind of sparked my interest in sports nutrition uh, because I made a ton of mistakes during that time. And I'm sure we'll unpack some of uh, some of those mistakes here today. I made plenty of them. Yeah, and in full disclosure to all of our listeners, um, you know, Alex is an absolute expert in this topic, but part of the reason why he and I are podcasting together today, or at least that we know each other, is because Alex and I actually raced together. We raced on a a small uh, continental team in, in, I think, 2018, and, you know, at the time, Alex was, uh, you know, I think, an aspiring climber, if I can speak for him, and and now he's, he's... like a, a much more, I'll say like athletic looking guy. So, so he's definitely, uh, you know, harnessed all those kind of nutritional tactics on himself to become, I think you, you at least appear to be a, a better, more capable athlete now. So, so I, yeah, I, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, it took several years of college education and a lot of hard learned lessons to get here. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, at one point I thought I was a climber and, uh, uh, now uh, I'm a much better athlete all around, and I can outclimb uh, 2018 me. So uh, I think it speaks to the holistic nature of uh, of being an athlete, if anything. T- totally, yeah. And we won't go down this wormhole, but I will uh, kind of bring up for you and all of our listeners the uh, you know kind of most recently famous anecdote about the uh, I don't remember the individual's name, but he was a like a Belgian. Uh, like a burgeoning U23 cyclist that, that gained, you know, something like 
20 kilograms and yeah. and now now he's just like an absolute weapon so so yeah sometimes like being as small as you possibly can isn't isn't the best thing for performance and that's not necessarily what this podcast is about but i think it is uh, a good thing to consider <laughs> right you know when when you're thinking about your your performance so um okay so before we jump in i want to explain what got me really interested in this topic um and we we actually talked about you know, the, the podcast that I'm going to mention here in a second before we started recording. But, um, so I was listening to an interview, uh, with a researcher named David Bishop who spoke about an overtraining study he did where they basically, you know, they took this group of people, you know, uh, you know, just sort of average cyclists and they, they just absolutely tried to crush them. Right. So they were, they were in the lab, you know, twice a day doing super high intensity intervals, just, just everything they could do to, to just really like overtrain these people. Um, but the one thing that they did that was sort of unique is that they controlled for underfueling in the study uh, by making sure they all got uh, 10 grams per kg uh, of body weight worth of carbohydrate per day. So this is a lot of carbohydrate. So uh, just to give our listeners an example, you know, I weigh 71 kg, so that'd be 710 uh, grams of carbohydrate per day. Um, and so despite the researchers best efforts to overtrain these people, um, they, they basically, they couldn't, you know, they were racked, right? Like they were very tired, but from like a performance perspective and from like a, a, even like a molecular perspective, you know, measuring something like citrate synthase activity, they just kept getting better. (laughs) Right. And so this study originally was slated to go on for two weeks. They actually ended up going a third week because they, they couldn't overtrain them. So, uh, Anyway, so so after hearing this, I started to think, okay, so if I have an athlete who doesn't seem to be recovering well or showing signs of overreaching, you know, maybe it's not something about their programming. And that's not to say that my program is always, you know, perfect and never responsible for, for you know, something going wrong. But uh, maybe the issue is under fueling. So my question to you, Alex, and I think this is a good jumping off point. Um, is this something that you see often, or do you have any general thoughts on the overtraining versus underfueling debate? We'll call it. Yeah, yeah, I, I've definitely got some thoughts on it, and it's definitely something I think is is pretty common. Um, I think it's I it's it's interesting that um, a lot of the athletes that I will initially see are underfueling, uh, but the messages that they hear in their environment are saying that we live in an obesogenic environment and that most people are over consuming. So we've got conflicting messages sometimes as athletes of like, you know, fat phobia or fear of carbohydrates or fear of food in general. Uh, And so that can be an issue for athletes because now we're okay. Well, I don't want to be like that. I want to be an athlete. So a large amount of what I do is is helping athletes learn how to fuel their body, and feed their body uh, appropriately. So uh, under is pretty rampant. Um, this is often one of the first things I work with athletes and that's regardless of, of athletic ability or level. A lot of people are under fueling. Um, clinically we would, we would call under fueling low energy availability, right? At least in like the training context and, and, w- and what that equation would kind of look like would be energy intake, the food I'm eating minus energy expenditure, my daily needs, uh, coupled with, uh, with training, um, divided by fat-free mass, metabolically active tissue. Um, and that can be disrupted, right? If that's in a deficit, if that's below a certain threshold and that's disrupted, biological function can start to be compromised. So that's kind of like the underfueling aspect of that. But in the definition of low energy availability, um, the disruption of both uh, training overload, excessive training, and inadequate energy intake are both culprits are both ways to kind of reach that same end. Uh, so there's there's right. two parts to that. You can you know, I'm I'm talking from the nutrition standpoint, but even in the nutritional definition, we have mentioned uh, the the overtraining piece of things. Right. Um, yeah. And and this is obviously just to clarify to all of our listeners, this is not to say that you you can't overtrain. Right. Like you can certainly mm-hmm. do too much intensity. You can do too much volume. There's there's so many mistakes that one could make in their training. Um, that could cause you to, to overtrain maybe despite the best nutrition, but, but it seems to me like, um, a lot of times, you know, maybe when your training isn't going well, this is something that you do have to consider, 
right? Mm-hmm. Like, am I, am I fueling for my, my training in living needs, right? And if you aren't, then, then that could be an easy solution. You can continue to train hard. Um, and you know, hopefully you would see more progress. You'd be happier, healthier, you know, more full of energy. So, um, but, but before I continue, I, I think you might've had more thoughts there. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we can both agree that there are some shared pathways there in terms of both underfueling and overtraining. So um, we have to really put on our, uh, our assessment hat and go like, all right, like what is the root cause of this and, and really kind of unpack that uh, for the athlete, both on, on your end as the coach and on my end as the dietitian, we have to go like, all right, which one is it here? Right. Which, and, and oftentimes it could be a reduction uh, a reduction in training and an increase in nutrition might, you know, you might have to go both sides of it. Right. Um, kind of, it's it's hard to to ascertain which one it is. And uh, I think just last month there was a paper that came out that uh, was titled, you know, does reds even exist? And that's not a, a slight to the the great work that's being done in that research field, uh, but it's kind of a question to go like, hey, are we forgetting about that overtraining effect as well? Are we forgetting about the other things that are also stressing and weighing on that athlete that could lead them to not positively respond to the training process, right? Mm-hmm. And from the nutrition side of things, you know, people have their reasons for underfueling. As I mentioned, I think we get mixed signals sometimes from, you know, we should be dieting. We should be on, you know, sugar is terrible for you. And we get all of these mixed messages. And I think sometimes we'll end up embodying those. And saying like, ooh, I need to like be slimmer or I need to kind of, you know, I don't want to be overweight or I don't want to eat these bad foods. At the same time, we're really trying to push ourselves in training. And, you know, the reality is we need to eat more. And sometimes that does include, you know, gummy bears or foods that might be deemed <laughs> uh, bad at, right. outside of the sporting context. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's funny you say that because I've, I've seen this with some of my athletes where, um, you know, we'll be on the phone, maybe they're doing a really intense training block and they're really focused, right? So they want to do their absolute best. They want to sort of nail things on all front, you know, the recovery, the nutrition, the training itself. And very proudly, they'll tell me, coach, you know, I'm, I'm nailing this block, you know, I'm doing everything right. I'm leaving no, no stone unturned, you know, every night for dinner, you know, it's, it's just salad and veggies and, you know, these things that are, um, I think programmed into us to be healthy and ensure they are healthy insofar as they're very nutrient dense foods, right? That's great. You know, we're getting all of our micronutrients, but, but I always have to say to them, like, that's fantastic. You know, I want you to eat whole foods. I want you to, to be healthy and do these, um, you know, you know, things that are going to be good for your general health. But like, we also really have to make sure that we're getting enough calories. You're doing hard training right now, right? Like maybe every day you're doing a thousand kilojoules on the bike and, you know, it's all high intensity. So it's a lot of carbohydrate, you you know, so like being healthy and fueling enough are, are sort of, you know, they're not always necessarily the same and, you know, and, and you're the nutritionist. So, so I won't uh, step on your toes with this, but it seems like you can, you can do both, right. You can eat, Mm -hmm. you know, foods that are both nutrient dense, but you can also make sure that you're eating enough. And I guess sometimes to your previous point, that means like, okay, we're going to have some gummy bears. We're doing this high intensity session. We need, we need glucose, you know? So, um, yeah. Any, any thoughts on that before we, we continue? Yeah, I I think, I think you nailed, you nailed it right there. Um, yeah. So I would say our preconceived notions of what health is again, are not always derived from the performance realm. They're derived from more of like a diet culture realm. So, so again, like where are these signals, where are our preconceived notions about health and nutrition coming from is that question we have to ask ourselves. And, you know, our environment is kind of telling us that like, yes, the salad, this is the correct, the healthy, the nutritious choice. Um, but what does like health really mean? Because if you're absolutely falling apart, your testosterone is crushed, your bone mineral density is terrible uh, because you're not eating enough. Okay. Right. So which one of those is really healthy? And, and I'll often describe this to athletes when, I'll hear this very frequently, like, well, I'm trying to stay away from, like, any bad foods right now, right? And, like, gummy bears would be the example of that. I always have to stop and kind of help us reframe the conversation around there are no good, bad, uh, there are no good foods or bad foods, right? There are some that are more nutritious. 
Uh, there's some that would be more appropriate or less appropriate for the time being. And I'm still trying to find like the best way to like good and bad, such an easy way to kind of like just right. just there. It's just it's good or it's bad. Um, but it's it's a lot more complicated that, than that, right? Because right. yeah, if you know eating salad and and then riding five hours uh, is 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 not the way to help by any means. No, no, yeah, and I think like you know we don't want to make this a, a, a sociology podcast, but I think by human nature we like to have these like heuristics or rules. We like yeah. to have kind of binaries. So I think maybe that's also part of it. But my goal for this podcast is to give our listeners some you know, good general guidelines on what they should be doing. And then if they want to have some binaries or they want to have at least heuristics, they can walk away from this podcast uh, with with some of that information. So um, underfueling is bad. You know, we all sort of, I think, intuitively know this. I I think, you know, athletes don't um, intentionally underfuel, right? But my suspicion is that many athletes don't really know they're underfueling, right? Because maybe they don't know... Um, the quantity of carbohydrates that's that's appropriate, or they don't know how to sort of scale up their carbohydrate intake with an increased training load, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so it seems like a lot of the carbohydrate hype in recent years has been around fueling on the bike. And so everyone is familiar with guidelines such as, you know, doing 60 to 90 grams per hour. But where I notice a, a specific deficit in knowledge is in guidelines for total daily intake, right? Mm-hmm. And so I, I had to look this up. Um, and I did some research and I found a chart from a, a a very famous researcher named Luis Burke. And so this is, um, this is a bit of an older study. I know at the top of the show, I promised, you know, the most current research, but, but I really like, um, a, a table that she, she put together here. And so I'll put this in the show notes, but, um, for now, I'm just going to sort of describe, um, her guidelines for chronic or everyday situation. So at the top of the list, we just have daily recovery or fuel needs for athletes with very light training program, which she describes as low intensity exercise or skill-based exercise. These targets may be particularly suited to athletes with large body mass or a need to reduce energy intake to lose weight. So that's, that's like the lowest kind of, um, rung of, of energy expenditure. And so what she recommends for that is three to five grams per kg of body weight per day. The next tier is daily recovery or fuel needs for athletes with moderate exercise programs. So she defines that as just 60 to 90 minutes a day. So maybe this kind of represents like a time crunch cyclist, like maybe somebody who's just doing, you know, one hour session, five days a week. And so for that, um, she gives a recommendation of five to seven grams per kg per day. And so we'll, we'll talk in a second about like what those numbers mean, but I can tell all of our listeners out there that even seven grams per kg per day is like a lot of carbohydrate. Like a lot of you might not even be getting that. Um, And then this is where I think um, a lot of my athletes um, or just cyclists in general might fall, or just endurance athletes in general, maybe. So that's daily recovery or fuel needs for endurance athletes, um, i.e. one to three hours of moderate to high intensity exercise a day. And so For that, we're seeing 7 to 12 grams per kg per day, which is a ton. You know, we we used that example earlier of um, in that study, they were eating, you know, a boatload of carbohydrates and they were doing 10. Um, Mm -hmm. And then her final rung is uh, daily recovery or fuel needs for athletes undertaking extreme exercise programs. So four to five hours of moderate to high intensity exercises. Uh, such as the the Tour de France is example she gave. So so if you're like out racing a stage race, you're doing Joe Martin or Tour of the Gila, you you would very likely fall into this category. And for that, it's it's more than uh, ten to twelve grams per kg per day. And uh, later in the show, we'll we'll give kind of an example of um, uh, some somebody who was in this situation. We can kind of <laughs> look at the numbers there. But uh, Alex, um, can you give us some insight into um, on average, where athletes of, of different training volumes, maybe like similar sort of categories to this, um, you know, fall into these ranges. And, and obviously there's a lot of variables here. Um, so maybe you can just speak to that, you know, what, how certain variables kind of turn up or turn down the carbohydrate demand, but, um, just some, some general guidance would be great. Yeah. Yeah. I think one thing to note here is while this, I mean, this graph that we're kind of reviewing here might be close to 20 years old. I think by and large, it holds pretty true. 
right? And it wouldn't it w- it wouldn't be a nutrition uh, based podcast if we didn't mention Luis Burke at least once. So this is a prime time to do it, right? The, these recommendations are they're pretty solid, great jumping off point. Of course, we'll talk later about how, how to maybe like customize these, but um, how we want to kind of think about this in relationship to volume uh, and, and to uh, maybe structure, like how do we make sense of this graph for our day to day? We could really just kind of go down the line and say like a low, moderate, high carbohydrate, and then you've got like your kind of elite performance. You could really break it down that simply as you're kind of going through this three to five, five to seven, seven to 12, right? Mm-hmm. And the is because at a moderate to high intensity uh, exercise, we're going to be primarily using carbohydrates as our fuel source, right? And even if we were on like the lower end of intensity, as you know, some of us might be doing some winter base training, that lower intensity ride might be going on four, five, six hours. That's still a long time to be at that. So even if you're using only 50% carbohydrate as your fuel source and fat as the other 50, the time is so long that that ends up eating into a lot of carbohydrate needs. So um, because we're using carbohydrate during exercise, right, and that and that's our primary source, um, we're going to be pulling this from muscle glycogen, right? Store carbohydrate in the muscle glycogen, also in the liver. Um, while we're using that, we only have a limited of, of ability to store it, right? And that's why that carbohydrate need is going to ebb and flow uh, ideally with our training volume, right? I've got a high demand for it, but a limited availability to store this. So for a smaller athlete, total body glycogen might be somewhere around four to 500 grams. That's arms, legs, you know, back, neck, everywhere, right? So uh, as a cyclist, you're not really using a lot of other muscles other than just those legs, and, you know, leg muscles. Um, so that, you know, that four to 500 might not, might not even really be available to you. It might be less than that. Um, right. So, uh, with, with that, uh, you've got your liver glycogen as well, maybe 90 minutes of intense exercise stored there. So, you know, in a, in a long day of cycling, um, we're burning through a lot of this. So, um, intensity and duration are going to be those big movers in terms of carbohydrate need. Uh, And and that's why you can kind of look at this graph and and just kind of simply quantify it in terms of uh, an easy day, um, you know, a moderate day, hard day, and then playing with those variables of, you know, is this a, you know, three hour session with intervals, which might be a really hard day, or is this a one hour uh, interval session? And that might be more of a moderate on the low end of moderate. So um, it might take a little work to kind of understand your training program and where you fall into that. Uh, but that's a really good jumping off point. The, the challenge with a lot of athletes is that they don't know how to quantify that. They don't know right. like, what is three to five grams. Like, I don't, you know, I'm not sure. Or even if I was sure, like, what should I be eating? So contextualizing that can be a challenge sometimes. Um, yeah. To, no, go ahead. To address that, I think a, a lot of times you'll see coaches and dietitians using like the most introductory model, which would be that performance plate model where you might see a portion of uh, starchy carbohydrates, protein, and then like colorful veg, right? And it's the portions change for the easy, the moderate, and and the hard days, with the hard being half your plate carbohydrates and then a quarter protein, uh, quarter veg, and then, you know, the opposite for the easy days. That's a a really, it, it sounds so simplistic, but it's actually a really good jumping off point for us to quantify that. More of my meals on my hard day should be looking like, burrito bowls and pasta dishes, right? right? As we're on an easier day, I might be having, you know, uh, you know some salads and sandwiches and, and more uh, whole foods from fruits and vegetables. Right, right. And so we can get in in a minute here um, to, you know, like how we might actually quantify this um, mm-hmm. and how we kind of might draw some of these lines around like, this is definitively a low carbohydrate day, or this is a moderate carbohydrate day, right? This is a high carbohydrate day. And I think for like most of our listeners, like we all kind of know, (laughs) you know, what the high carb days look like, like that's pretty intuitive, right? So, you know, I I don't want to necessarily draw these lines. um, But but like, if you're doing your long days, right, like if you're on your weekend training rides, you know, maybe one day you're doing a group ride, it's three hours, the next day you're doing four or five hours of just endurance. 
would you agree that like both of those situations qualify as, as like a high carb day? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it's, it's also going to depend on that athlete's fitness, uh, you know, where they're at and you know, how efficient are they uh, and what that, right. you know, what that course looks like for their training day. So, yeah, those, I mean, more often than not for those um, longer duration sessions, we're gonna, those are going to be high, high carbohydrate days. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And so just, just like a little bit of X fizz for some of our listeners out there who aren't, um, maybe aware of this idea and and Alex, you can speak to this too, if if this is something that you know a lot about, but, um, not all athletes are going to be burning the same percentage of carbohydrate at the same intensity. So even, you know, when we talk about FTP, you know, in, in the more scientific realm, you know, that's often talked about as your anaerobic threshold, right? You know, there's this sort of inflection point there. And so, you know, even at uh, 100% of FTP, you're, you're not necessarily burning 100% carbohydrate, right? There's still some kind of differences between individuals. And so I think maybe even like the better example is that, and this is maybe where there's even more variability, is at like the top of your endurance zone or like mm-hmm. LT1 slash VT1. You're, you're not necessarily not everybody's going to be at 50%, right? So, you know, I think what this really kind of points to is that if you wanted to be sort of, you know, at a Tade Pogacha level of precision with your, with your nutrition, you know, you would maybe have to, to, to know these numbers, right? But for most of us, I think we can, we can, um, you know, make some, some generalizations. Any, any thoughts on that, Alex? Yeah. Yeah. I would say, you know, if you, if you have done a VO2 max test and you can see those different inflection points in your, the respiratory exchange ratio at that, and like, you know, we can get into all the software out there from AeroTune to inside. And uh, there's some papers we might mention later that are kind of taking these metrics and really uh, distilling down like carbohydrate recommendations. There's a, a whole new world of like individualization around carbohydrate supplementation, both on and off the bike. Um, but you know, we shouldn't get lost in the weeds here because we're most of us, right. Are not, uh, Tade and, uh, right. the level of precision with that, uh, doesn't need to necessarily be exact all the time. Uh, most of the time in dietetics, I'm going to present things in ranges because, uh, mm. we are not perfect. We are not robots. Uh, there's variability in our day to day. Uh, and even in, you know, uh, the calories on your granola bar, there's a variance allowed by the FDA of up to 20%. So, you know, how precise can we really be? Uh, presenting in a range, I think, gives uh, direction, but then also allows for uh, normal variance without overstressing people. Yeah, yeah. And, and so before we continue, I'm going to go back to that chart for one section, one second, excuse me, um, because they have um, some recommendations for acute situations as well. Um, mm. and, and this is leading to, I think, a, a relevant point here. So... Um, one of those acute situations is a pre-event meal to increase carbohydrate availability before prolonged exercise session. And so they give the recommendation of one to four grams per kg eaten one to four hours before exercise. So you can think of this as, you know, if you have two hours before you're about to race or do a hard training session, you can eat two grams per kg worth of carbohydrate, right? And if it's three hours and three, um, and, and the reason I bring this up, um, aside from that, it's a good piece of information for our listeners is, is that if, if you try and do this and you, you weigh this out, um, it, like it becomes like, you're, you're going to feel like you don't need to be that precise because getting two grams per kg worth of oatmeal is like really, really hard. Right. And it's going to be way more oatmeal than you've ever eaten. And so I would challenge all of our listeners to try and do this. So take those recommendations. And next time you're getting ready for a big ride, um, you know, that two to three hours before, you know, weigh out, uh, you know, 140 grams of carbohydrate worth of oatmeal or pancakes or pasta or rice or whatever your carbohydrate of choice is. And it, it's going to be like very obvious to you sort of what that looks like. Um, cause it's going to be a lot and, and hopefully actually it's more than you've, you've been doing before, because that means that, okay, you know, we up till now haven't been checking that box. We've been sort of underdoing it. We've been missing the mark in terms of, you know, that, that pre event or pre training 
carbohydrate uh, goal or target. So um, that means that that here forward, you're going to be better fueled, right? Because now you know what that kind of quantity of of carbohydrate looks like, and you're going to be better fueled for your for your training sessions. And I think overall, you know, when we think about your day in total, you're going to be more likely to kind of be at the right energy balance, right? And is that the right way to kind of talk about that, Alex? Yeah, yeah, I would I would say so. And one thing I do with a lot of uh, the athletes I work with is kind of walk through different scenarios, like your pre-race meal, uh, your pre-Saturday long training ride, kind of go through different scenarios of of how we're going to quantify and how we're going to meet some of these nutritional recommendations. So I'll, I might give, depending on how you, you know, how you think, I might give calories and grams. I might give, you know, fist, palm, thumb kind of portions. Uh, there's different ways of kind of going about that, but it's definitely an interesting challenge to like actually, not that I recommend weighing out your food all the time, but it's an interesting experiment to go through to go like, what is 140 grams of carbohydrate via uh, oatmeal, what does that really look like? Right. Uh, and I think, yeah, you'll pretty soon realize like, oh, I've probably been underfueling for some of these hard days. Um, the the one the one caution I would give is, uh, I re- I don't know that I've ever recommended four grams. Uh, no, of carbs. it's impossible. <laughs> and I don't know that I've ever recommended three, two and a half. Is probably the highest I've ever gone with sure. recommendation. It's it's hard and you don't feel amazing trying to go up to three to three to four it's that's a lot right right yeah so you know i i don't know what the the number for like total daily intake would be that represents Mm -hmm. this feeling but but i would wager that for me to do let's say seven eight nine grams per kg per day i i would basically just be eating as much carbohydrate as i possibly could right like like it, it wouldn't be there'd be a lot of biofeedback like okay you you were very full, <laughs> you know, yeah. this is it. And, and I think you only need to do that once, right? Because, yeah. you know, to Alex's point, like you're not going to do four, like it's just, it would be very, very hard. And so if you do two, you'll, you'll just see what that quantity of food looks like. And you also notice kind of how full you feel. Um, and then, you know, maybe you just strive for that on, on days that have a similar kind of ride or race schedule. But um you know, another thing I wanted to bring up, and, and you touched on this a little bit, is that, um, you know, we're, we're fueling for the day that we're in, the training session that we're having, um, but, but sometimes there's more at stake than other times. And so what I mean by this is, depending on what your specific training schedule looks like, so let's say, you know, it's, it's Thursday, and tomorrow's Friday, and you have a recovery day, maybe there's a little bit less at stake in that situation than if... Mm-hmm. It's Tuesday and you have your hardest session, but you know, tomorrow, Wednesday, uh, I'm also doing intervals. And so, you know, that's a situation where I feel like, um, you know, if you're going to really focus in on, on a couple of days a week, it's, it's when you are really needing to refuel for the next day. You want to come into that next session with the most complete glycogen stores possible. Um, and so, you know, I don't want to get bogged on here too much, but, but is that, kind of how you think about it as well. Like we'll get way more into kind of periodizing one's carbohydrate intake later, but um, is that a kind of a a fair assertion? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the more condensed that timeline is for recovery, the more important the recovery elements then become, right? If you've got less than eight hours to replenish glycogen before your next session, right? Maybe you're doing an Omnium and there's a a crit time trial or something of that sort. Um, that's a challenge. That's really hard. You got to be very intentional with your nutrition. Uh, but if you've got three days until your next bout of intervals, you're going to be well fed and rested enough to probably get through that. Um, even if you're being a little bit lax with your nutrition in most, in most scenarios. Right. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. So before we, we, we go further down that, that rabbit hole, um, I just want to zoom out for a second and talk about both um, what's at stake here and, um, you know, what nailing our nutrition targets can do for us as athletes. So um, part of the way that I've been thinking about this when I did my research for this this episode is I read uh, a few studies where they have two groups eating the same amount of calories during, you know, in all these studies, it was um, focused on like an intensified training period. So like maybe seven days where they really kind of ramped up the training for these athletes just to kind of um, you know, make clearer conclusions. Um, and in, and in this study, you know, they have two groups, 
same amount of calories. One group is doing moderate carbohydrate, uh, while other is doing high carbohydrate. So in the context of these studies, um, just to give some ballpark numbers, maybe the moderate carbohydrate group was doing six grams per kg per day, you know, during like this little seven day training camp. And the high group was maybe doing eight or nine, let's say, right? So, you know, in the big scheme of things, it doesn't seem like that huge of a difference. Um, but, but when they look at what happens to these athletes, uh, the moderate groups basically always showed like terrible signs of overtraining, um, while the high carbohydrate group w- would fare much better. And so in at least one of these studies, they, they looked at kind of what the repercussions were after as well. So after they kind of recovered from this, this intensified training period, and then, you know, just got back to their normal training, the group that had been doing high carbohydrate, um, they were better, right? Like they, they, they saw this like kind of super compensation effect in their performance. They also just felt better. So like a big piece of this or a big way that we can kind of think about this or think about what's at stake is in a uh, rate of perceived exertion, right? So, you know, in, in these studies, and, you know, there was three in particular that I read, um, all the groups got through their training. They all did it, right? Like they all made it through, which is, you know, it's great. So, so this is all to say, like, you can be doing an insufficient job at, at fueling yourself and you can still complete your training, right? So, you know, it's not so clear as that, but, but what I will say about that kind of moderate or slightly kind of uh, lower carbohydrate group is that the reported RPE for those sessions was, was almost always much, much higher. So they did the, the, the long endurance rides, they did the interval sessions, but when they did it, it felt really hard. Whereas the, the high carbohydrate group, you know, they, they felt fine, you know, like it felt sort of normal. So, um, my interpretation of all of this is that eating enough calories is not enough. It's, it's a necessary, but not sufficient condition to prevent overtraining or overreaching in kind of a lesser, lesser severe case. Um, is, is that your experience? Um, or, or does this kind of, um, provide us a good stepping stone to kind of talk about, you know, you know, maybe what a lot of our athletes who are just slightly under fueling are experiencing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, how a lot of athletes will present this misconception of like, okay, I just need to match. I just need to make sure I'm eating enough or I just need to make sure I'm fueling. Um, how that is usually presented to me initially by the athlete. is like, um, I'm eating all these different foods and, you know, this chicken that's giving me a lot of energy and this is, you know, like it, we're, we're conceptualizing everything here together as all of this food gives me energy, which is correct in a sense, right? Like <laughs> if we're met like calories being that measurement of energy and food. Sure. That's it's giving that chicken's giving me energy as well as the potato on my plate. Uh, but the, the challenge here is that uh, it, how we spend that energy is not the same across the board. Um, right. And, and I think this is why you see these studies that kind of show energy matched, but differences in carbohydrates. We, we see this effect uh, because, as I mentioned earlier, moderate to high intensity exercise, we're going to be using that carbohydrate. Right. We're going to be preferring that carbohydrate. Our brains are running on glucose. So mood is going to decrease. RPE is going to go up because, you know, I'm I'm literally not getting enough of the carbohydrates to my brain. Muscle contraction glucose is involved in that. So I'll get from runners, I'll hear heavy legs and I hear heavy legs and nine times out of 10, like we have not been refueling like well enough. Like things are just not contracting. They're not moving well enough. Things that ever feels heavy, the RPE goes up, right? So that carbohydrate piece has got to be there for us to really be able to, uh, you know, think coherently to make, uh, you know, skill-based decisions. Uh, to be able to perform these high-end muscle contractions. Uh, and, we, yeah, we can get through it. I have no doubt my athletes of, like, the toughness or grit. But there's a difference between, like, I just kind of rammed my head through this thing and just gritted my teeth versus, like, hey, I actually, like, I nailed that training session and got the elicited reaction. Um, I try to think about this. If, if we're, we're thinking about carbohydrates as our energy source, as our fuel source during exercise, um, we can think about, uh, you know, protein as, as, as doing a, a structural job, right? It's, it's part of the bone matrix. It is, it's, you know, trying to build and repair bone mass. It doesn't want to be used as energy. So uh, 
consuming protein, for example, before exercise might, uh, you know, st uh, stave off hunger, but it's not necessarily going to do anything for our performance. Only about 5% of that protein is going to be utilized during exercise because it, it'd be the equivalent of you chopping down a, a section of your house to throw into the fireplace to keep the, to keep the place <laughs> warm, right? It, it's trying right. to do a structural job. And while fat is, even in the leanest athletes, in abundance, we have days, if not weeks worth of fat, even in the leanest amongst us, um, that fat is inefficient as a fuel source. So the higher intensity efforts, um, it's going to be a real struggle for us to use fat to fuel for that. So, so it makes sense to me that uh, matching energy but lowering carbohydrates is going to have this kind of disconnect between like the, what you're asking of the body versus what the body is ready and willing and able to do. Right. Yeah. So, and if, if we use like a kind of like a contrived sports car analogy, right. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe we think of protein as like the oil in your engine, right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not, your car is not running on oil, but it's a totally necessary piece of making mm -hmm. sure that things are running smoothly. Whereas the carbohydrate is the fuel, right? Like we, we have fat in the system already. We, we don't need to be um, necessarily concerned with consuming a ton of fat before a ride, for example, right? But we do need a ton of carbohydrate because your car needs fuel and it can only mm -hmm. carry so much, which kind of goes back to the uh, like glycogen as a, as a fuel tank analogy, right? Like those are our reserves. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we, we don't want to be running on empty. We want to top off that gas tank if we have a hard session, right? We need as much fuel as is available to, to kind of make it through that and to thrive. And, um, yeah, I, I guess like the analogy gets a little wonky here, but you know, maybe doing like too little carbohydrate is sort of analogous to like putting like a, you know, vegetable oil from, from the uh, Chinese restaurant in your car as, as fuel versus like high carbohydrate is like, you know, getting the, the 93 <laughs> from the gas station. Um, but, but another thing uh, I just want to mention, this actually wasn't in our show notes, but, but something that you said, Alex, brought this mm -hmm. up for me. And it's uh, a comment I read in a review by Tim Podlegar where he talks about, you know, okay, so what are the reasons why some athletes would, would try and do this sort of, you know, very low carbohydrate approach? And, and mm -hmm. one of the things that people cite is that they want to be able to burn more fat, right? So there's mm -hmm. this idea... Um, that seems intuitive, like, okay, we're going to, um, you know, we're, we're going to run our body on fats and then we're going to get better, better at using fat. Right. And, and so like, in, you know, when you say that it, it sounds correct, but the, the really interesting thing that I love that Tim pointed out was that <laughs> your ability to oxidize fat is really actually a function of like mitochondrial content, um, mm -hmm. in function. Right. And so, uh, what are uh, mitochondrial content and function, um, you know, related to, and they're related to volume, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like how much volume you're doing and getting that, that high citrate synthase activity, um, you know, as being a marker of that. Um, and, and how do we do big volumes of training? Uh, well, well, we fuel well, right? Yeah. So, so we saw from the earlier guidelines, you know, if you're going to be doing you know, four hours a day, you need to be taking in a ton of carbohydrate. And so yeah. you take in a ton of carbohydrate, you do lots of training, you know, uh, your mitochondrial content goes up, uh, your mitochondrial function maybe goes up as well, you know, from some of the intensity and, and boom, now you actually, by doing that, by eating more carbohydrates, you, you've tricked yourself and, and now you can, <laughs> you can burn more fat, you can oxidize more fat. So, yeah. um, yeah, um, but it, but anyway, uh, one other thing I wanted to touch on and get your your thoughts on is um, something that I read in a couple of these studies was that one of the other negative effects of doing the lower carbohydrate approach, even at that kind of like moderate quantity, um, mm. so you know, and maybe that moderate quantity is 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 what a lot of people are just intuitively doing, um, is that their ability to oxidize carbohydrates was actually hampered. So like when they measured them their metabolism at the beginning and the end of the study, the, the lower carbohydrate group almost uh, universally like showed less ability to oxidize carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so, you know, it seems like this is like good evidence against like the so-called train low approach. So, um, you know, any, any thoughts on, on that, on like maybe the effects of 
um, going too low on carbohydrate aside from the possibility of overtraining or, or ending up in this low energy availability? Yeah, I mean, from what I've read in the research and a lot of this, uh, you can you can go back and give the supernova study from Louise Burke a uh, uh, Google, and you can see over years she's tried to kind of unpack um, high fat diets, low carbohydrate diets, and and what that means for endurance athletes, right? And, and the the promise there is that, as I mentioned earlier, carbohydrate stores they're going to be used in high intensity. There's a limited fuel source, so if you could burn more fat. Right. If you could do that and then that spares that precious muscle glycogen, you would then therefore be in a better position later on in a race or an event uh, because, right, I'm, I've got weeks right. worth of fat on my body. So that's kind of like the promise with uh, low carbohydrate, high fat diets, that kind of approach, ketogenic diets. That's kind of what the promise is. But by and large, what we see is that the enzymes responsible in breaking down carbohydrates get down regulated as that carbohydrate starts coming down in the diet, which makes sense, right? There's less of it. So now it's coming down. I mean, you could think about this from culturally, cultures that don't have a lot of dairy products in their diet might have a higher prevalence of lactose intolerance. That food is not in that system that's genetically being passed down. So or there's not a lot of it. Now genetically we're passing this down. It gets down regulated. Um, maybe that's a reach. Maybe it's not. But I think it makes sense intuitively that like, yeah, you're eating less of it. So it's going to get a little bit more down regulated than that. So uh, my argument would be if we know that our race is going to be determined by, you know, a key attack, a uh, finishing sprint, something that's going to require some high intensity, right? Um, why would we want that down regulated uh, in, in, in our diet? And to the points that we've made before in terms of handling training volume and training load and the real, in, like the interval work that we're trying to do during training, this is potentially being compromised with a low carbohydrate diet, right? Um, then you kind of go into the train low approach, which there's only key sessions in which you're training uh, with low carbohydrate availability. Um, and that's a lot of that stuff still theoretical. Um, you know, is it low liver glycogen? Is it low muscle glycogen? Mm. Is it fasted? There's a whole lot of not so well understood things that are kind of going on here on the train low approach. Um, potentially worth investigating at the absolute elite end of the sport where the resources are there and there, you know, there's dietetic support. Uh, but I think by and large, a lot of us would do well to kind of steer clear of a lot of that train low approach for the time being and try to focus more on the periodization of carbohydrates. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you, uh, brought that all up because, you know, you know, I've read a lot of these, you know, reviews on the train low approach. And, and one thing that they all concede is that, okay, yeah. So, uh, AMPK, which is like one of these, um, you know, adaptive endurance pathways is stimulated by low, low glycogen source, right? You know, so, so they have shown that like with this train low approach, you do get this elevated signal and AMPK activation. Right. But uh, what none of the train low studies have shown is is an actual like increase in performance. Right. So yeah. we, we have this signal that's going up, um, but but it's not actually matching up with with increased performance in the long run. So, you know, for those who are really interested, you can look in that um, on your own and, and, you know, maybe you'll have a different conclusion. But but it seems to me like like the safer thing is, you know, OK, you, you fuel your rides. You're still going to end up with low glycogen source, right? So you still yeah. get that AMP ac AMPK activation regardless, right? Mm -hmm. Like taking in exogenous carbohydrates isn't necessarily going to spare muscle glycogen. So if you do long enough rides, it, it's going to be low at the end anyway, right? Mm -hmm. And then by taking in carbohydrates, we, we fill that back up and we can do it again, right? And we can do a lot more training that way. So so I, I don't know that anybody's like looked at this or I don't even know exactly how you would quantify this. But maybe it's like you're you're trading like this super amplified signal from this one session. It's this very acute thing mm -hmm. versus like you're getting AMPK activation, like ride in and ride out because you can be consistent. You can you, you're you're not just fueling for that day. You're fueling for tomorrow and the next day, and yeah. you're just kind of keeping everything going, right? Yeah, it's it's a it's a, a training lever that you could pull, right, to try to elicit an adaptation, but. Um, 
you know, and this might just be me being a little conservative on it. I, you know, I think it's kind of playing with fire at the time for, for most athletes. And that's, I've played around with it just because as a dietitian, I feel like, I don't know, you, sometimes you just want to like, all right, what does that look like? What, how would I <laughs> recommend that? And you know, that, that training is, uh, you have to be really intentional with refueling afterwards not fueling too much after your, your previous session. So I'm, I got a glycogen deplete and then have just a salad or something for dinner and then sleep and then wake up and then just, you know, it's a very tedious thing. And, and I feel like uh, it's not practical for most of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's someone whose life is nutrition. <laughs> right. Um, totally. Very, it was hard for me to try to implement and experiment with. Uh, but also again, there's with, with any of these training stressors, uh, be it physiological or metabolic in this case, what are the what are the knock on effects with that? And just this year, we've had papers come out from um, the originator, James Morton, the person who brought up this fuel for the work required that train low approach. His group at uh, Liverpool, John Moore's, actually had a study that came out saying adolescent soccer players that were doing this train low model actually had more uh, bone, bone resorption, decreased bone metabolism because of that approach. So what are we then doing for these junior athletes if we were trying to implement this as, as coaches or dietitians to say like bone health is already pretty compromised in this non-weight bearing sport. Um, you know, like, is this really something we want to mess with? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that sounds like really bad news. <laughs> right. Um, and then, you know, um, I think we both have this in our notes, but one thing that I also want to mention before we, we kind of move on from, some of the consequences of, of going too low on carbohydrate is, is immune function, right? Yeah. So, you know, if you're an athlete out there and, and you're, you feel like your training is going fine, but you notice that you get sick a lot, right? Like, I don't, I don't know how to quantify a lot. Like maybe, you know, every couple of months you, you find that you're, you're run down again or you're sick again and you're missing training that could be related to, to insufficient fueling. So yeah. uh, any, any thoughts on that, Alex? Yeah, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of shared metabolic pathways with overtraining and underfueling. Um, I would mentioned it earlier, but I don't know that I explained it. Red's relative energy deficiency in sport is essentially a constellation of, of symptoms uh, that can occur within an athlete um, when prolonged low energy availability uh, is, is at play. Uh, so if athletes are not familiar with that, um, this would definitely be something worth looking into to just pull up. Um, REDS and CAT2 uh, tool that I think if you Google search that you'll find this nice graph this round circle graph that kind of just shows low energy availability in the center and then the constellation of signs and symptoms that can branch out from that for low energy availability keeping in mind that overtraining can also be part of this um, sure. you might find a couple things that might align with you and you know, it's, it's worth a discussion with dietitian coach healthcare practitioner uh, and definitely gaining more traction um, in, in the literature and in practice these days, thankfully. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and, and so this is changing gears just a little bit, but but I wanted to make sure that we brought it up because I found it really interesting. Um, so so you and I spoke last week and you told me about a, a paper that mm -hmm. looked at the energy demands of a female world tour cyclist while she was racing the Tour de Femmes. And what they found uh, was that she was burning around 7,000 calories per day and I think taking in maybe like 5,000 a day. And so, you know, within that, she was eating 13.7 grams per kg mm -hmm. per day worth of carbohydrate on average, right? So this is across the whole Tour de Femmes. Yeah. Um, and so she was still, and even at that quantity, she was still ending up in this big deficit, right? And there was all sorts of, you know, kind of maybe, she she still finished, you know, kind of <laughs> to go back to her earlier analogy, like, she still, you know, finished the Tour de Femmes, right? You know, it's not mm -hmm. like she, she had to stop because of this. But um, my question for you is, is, and I don't know that you can even answer this, but is, is there a certain volume at which, uh, you know, if we assume just kind of like an average intensity factor of like 0.7 per week, you know, for the mm -hmm. week as a whole, right? You know, maybe, maybe if, if you do 15 hours a week, um, at that point, can, should you just be eating as much as humanly possible? Like, wh where is that line? And, and so anecdotally, just real quick, uh, you know, I feel like I'm always behind, right? Like, I feel like I'm always trying to just eat as much as I can to kind of stay on top of this. And, and I only ride, you know, maybe 12 to 15 hours a week, you know, on average. So, you know, not a huge amount, but 
Um, yeah, any uh, <laughs> any thoughts on like where that line is, if my question is clear? Yeah, so um, I've got a lot of thoughts. My brain's spinning. So, so to clarify, like essentially what volume of food should we be like at what volume should we just be eating everything in size or at like at you know yeah yeah okay okay yeah um <laughs> yeah that's a, a a tricky question um this study is is so i i love the fact that we're giving um you know we're giving more research funding dollars uh towards some some female um oriented like athletic uh, athletic endeavors like this is it's such a cool study um, and I think the first of its kind too. So it, we're, I think we're just opening the can of worms here in terms of like, <laughs> what does this mean? This athlete was like, I think they were 2000, yeah, like 2000 calories down a day and they're still getting through it. And they st stated in the article that they had personal best, they had PRs, like they were still, despite this, um, you know, reduction in, in energy intake and this big gap in demand, um, they were actually hitting like crushing five minute PR stuff. Like, so right. um, the, the takeaway that the authors had in this is that performance might not be the best indicator of low energy availability. Um, and athletes can do very well despite maybe some not great nutritional practices, um, which I think, you know, I've definitely seen athletes that are doing well and, you're just like, oh my gosh, like their diet is falling apart. Like they're doing all the things wrong and they're doing well. And it's like, ah, how long is that going to last? Like right. they're kind of getting rewarded for doing something that's like really terrible. And you're just sitting there watching this car wreck. Um, yeah. And it's, it's only later than that you start to see like the wheels kind of come off, but the performance peaks at first. So who knows if that is, if that's the case here, um there there man i've got a lot of thoughts on this um yeah i'm i'm gonna i'm definitely gonna get sidetracked on this because this study is just like lighting my brain up uh you okay. know in terms of like how much should we be eating to kind of like keep up with that um you know i think going back to that periodization is is probably like your starting point right because uh, even within this this athlete didn't eat the exact same thing day to day and we've seen from the, both the tour and the Vuelta, we've seen case studies where athletes are eating anywhere from five grams of carbohydrate per kilo on a rest day to upwards of 17.9 uh, grams per kilo. I want to say I remember Chris Froome in the Giro, maybe was it 2017 when he had that like crazy stage where he taxed like way far, I forget what the stage was, but I want to say they sided him at like 19 grams of carbohydrate per kilo. Wow. So we've yeah. seen just from five to 19 grams of carbohydrate per kilo. I think the periodization is, is definitely like the way to kind of conceptualize this. Um, you got to eat big for big days. I think that would kind yeah. of be like my takeaway for that. When you know you have subsequent big days, um, you're going to have to stay on top of that recovery fueling. Uh, you're not, you're not going to be able to be lax with that, but what that's going to look like for everyone is going to be individual. So that's where, uh, working with a sports dietitian is going to be really beneficial because I don't know that I can blanket statement and say like at what volume should you do sure. that because we've seen we've seen riders gain weight at the tour so right my brain's going off of like what does this mean that this athlete was you know 2,000 plus calories down a day when we've got uh, was it Aaronsman that gained like several kilos yeah 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 uh, so, so you know it, it, these riders have different jobs. There's different parkour. There's different uh, responsibilities. Um, the services, of course, um, uh, you know, I, I can imagine are different between the men and the women of the tour. Sure. So, you know, what were the services available to that team versus, you know, um, those riders gaining weight during the tour? I, I've got a lot of thoughts on this, but my my thought really goes to like, you know, what, <laughs> yeah, what what are the nutritional practices going on in this team to where this rider is, is down that far and you know that's right. not to throw any to that team sure 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 I yeah and, I yeah mean. totally yeah we, we yeah we, we have a lot of ground to cover yet so we'll we'll save that for you know maybe a follow-up episode but 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 one thing that i wanted to bring up and this this again is something that's on our show notes but just a, a tangent based on something that you said mm -hmm. is you know you're talking about you know riders like gaining or losing weight in the tour and so this this question isn't directly related to that but it, it it does go back to something else you said so you you brought up the study or i guess it's more of a review that that asker did mm -hmm. titled you know does does reds exist right 
you know, in, in one thing he was talking about as a consequence of low energy availability is this, uh, you know, like concept of your, your metabolism basically just slowing down. So, um, mm-hmm. I think, I think what it was called is adaptive thermogenesis. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and it sounds to me, you know, like that can go in either direction, right? So it can either go up and you just have more energy and you're fidgeting and, you know, yeah. you feel good. Or, you know, if you're not eating enough, your body basically will just adjust and, you know, you just kind of become a log. So, you know, one thing that I think is, is, uh, really kind of, I think important to consider is, um, just maybe you want to lose some weight, right? Let's mm-hmm. say you, you want to get down to 10% body fat, just as just a, a hypothetical here, um, so that you have this higher Watts per kilo, um, and at your current energy intake, it, you're not losing any weight. So then, you know, I, as a coach, am saying, Hey, like, you know, it seems like you're not recovering well and, and maybe we should look at your fueling. Like we should look into whether or not you're eating enough, you know, mm-hmm. and then their fear is, okay, well, you know, sure. Like, yeah, maybe I would perform better if I ate more, but, but then I wouldn't lose the weight or I would gain weight. Right. Which is the opposite of what they're, they're looking to do. Um, yeah. any, any thoughts on that, on, on kind of this, um, kind of adaptability of the body when, when you're in this state of low energy availability? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to be case by case and athlete by athlete in terms of what those body composition goals are. Um, more often than not, uh, regardless of where that athlete is in sport or in life, I feel like most athletes come to me wanting to lose five to 10 pounds. So it's like this alluring thing of like, Ooh, this is something I can control. And like, I can do that. I can lose five to 10 pounds. Um, so I think oftentimes body composition goals are like this, uh, seemingly low hanging fruit that we can kind of reach for. Uh, so one thing I work a lot with athletes is, is just trying to like, you know, is that really an appropriate goal? I think it's my first mm-hmm. question, which right. um, I've, I've helped athletes lose weight, but it's typically not the first thing that I, I, I work with an athlete on. Um, I think uh, one of the misconceptions when it comes to, this constrained energy model, um, you know, trying to lose weight and, and, and trying to balance this in performance. Um, it's, it's not linear in terms of I drop 500 calories a day and now I lose a pound a week. Uh, and I just do that until I hit my goal. Like that's, that's not how that works. Part of that adaptive process is that, well, you're now a lighter person through the training process. You're more efficient right? You're getting the the exercise cost is going down. The physical cost of moving around is going down. Yeah, you might be fidgeting less. Um, There's a lot of different factors that are going into the adjustment for your body to kind of rein back that weight loss because your body doesn't really want to lose weight. Um, So it's not linear in terms of that. It's going to be that kind of, you know, that that slow curve down. And that's where we see weight plateaus with athletes. So Mm -hmm. on one hand, I always question, like, is a weight loss goal actually even appropriate for us? Uh, And on the other hand, when the athletes do want to lose a little bit of weight, uh, instead of just trying to, like, target that and worry about, like, this adaptive process and all the numbers and things like that, I I find more often than not, um, if I can help athletes become a competent eater and be a little bit more intuitive, right, we take a more holistic approach to this, um, we end up having weight loss as a byproduct. Um, but it's not necessarily our primary outcome. And what I mean by that eating competence would be having like a positive eating attitude, right? We're happy. We appreciate food. We're not scared or it doesn't elicit anxiety. We accept a diverse array of foods. We have contextual skills like it's someone's birthday. I'm not going to pack my own salad and bring it with me to the party. Like I'm, I can contextualize like, you know, having fun foods, having enjoyment in foods, having a glass of wine here and there, I can put that together. And I also know when I should and should not have certain foods, right? Um, and then having a little bit of internal regulation, right? I'm not just eating out of motion. Uh, I'm kind of queuing into when I'm hungry, what those signs look like. So that's, that would be a, a, a competent eater in my mind. And, and that goes kind of along the lines of intuition as well with that regulation piece. So um, lots of different concepts coming at you there, but in terms of like that body composition piece, I find that, you know, if we can focus on making you uh, have a better relationship with food and body to begin with, that body composition is probably going to go where the body wants to take it. 
Um, sure. And that might not look like a ripped six pack. Um, it might not look like, uh, you know, the edited Instagram, whatever, uh, but it, it leads to a sustainable change. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that really kind of squares with my experience as well on the coaching side of things. Right. Um, you know, I always tell people, and this is probably an oversimplification, but, but I would rather have you end up losing weight because we're doing a lot of and really good training mm-hmm. than, than, than having to, you know, feel like you, you have to kind of, you know, fight super hard for this caloric deficit every day. Right. Yeah. So in other words, it's just sort of a happy byproduct um, is I think, you know, the way that I think about what you're saying, right. And you know, a lot yeah. more about this than I do, but, um, but yeah, and we need to feel well to do a lot of training. Right. And then the rest of sort of just works itself out. Um, yeah. You could probably look at that as like the difference between process and outcome oriented goals. I want to lose 10 pounds as an out as an outcome, right? Like I want to win the race, same thing. The thing about the process, like, well, I'm going to learn how to uh, build a, a, a plate that has an abundance of fruit, veg, fiber. I'm going to learn how to do a little bit more culinary skills. I'm going to plan ahead for my meals. I'm going to make sure I'm feeling well. I'm going to really consider like how much is social media or external factors weighing on my body image. That is a process. It takes a lot of work, but it leads to a better outcome. Right. So if I just say I'm going to win the race or else I'm going to be crushed when I don't. Right. Yeah. So I, I yeah. think that's the parallel I might draw there. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, I don't want to get in too deeply to like um, giving, giving our listeners like, quick guidelines for trying to lose weight, right? I think that this is an area that, that needs to be approached really, um, you know, at like a personalized level, right? Because it's, it's a tricky topic. And, and yeah. as you already alluded to, like, yeah, sure. Like everybody kind of wants to be five pounds lighter. I mean, I'm a pretty lean individual and there was definitely years in my cycling where, you know, I just wanted to weigh 154 pounds because 70 kgs was like a nice number, <laughs> right? Or, or, you know, whatever that works out to. But uh, yeah, in my case, yeah, it probably wasn't even something that was going to help my performance. It probably would have came at too great a cost, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, but but for our listeners out there, you know, if you really do think, okay, I, you know, I do need to lose some weight, you know, talk talk to somebody mm-hmm. like Alex, right, and come up with come mm-hmm. up with an approach, right? Um, because it's it's really just in in my opinion, and, and based on everything that we've discussed here today, and in all the research I've done, it's risky business, right? Yeah. You know, if you're trying to train and perform. You know, that, that goal is sort of at odds with, you know, trying to be in this caloric deficit, right? Is that, Absolutely. yeah. 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 Um, okay. So, you know, this is something that we touched on earlier and we've been kind of holding ourselves back. Um, so two of the behemoths in the sport nutrition world, and, and these are names that that cycling fans are probably even familiar with, are Asker Yukendrup and Tim Pildegar, right? You know, they're, they work for world tour teams. They're producing like new interesting research and reviews you know these guys are at sort of the the top of the game um and in both of their work something that keeps seems to be continuing to come up as sort of a new frontier is um you know like more personalized and more periodized nutrition right so what that means is like being really really specific about how much you specifically need um so you know alex what can you tell us about what's happening in that area uh, a lot. <laughs> uh, I, like, uh, as we were uh, preparing for this, this uh, podcast, uh, I, two papers came out, I think, like this past month. Um, one of them being, uh, you know, essentially a, a validation of like an algorithm that was um, trying to predict uh, carbohydrate usage during a, an exercise bout. Uh, and the, the challenge there is that uh, we, you have to have some knowns, right? Like you need to know your respiratory exchange rate for a certain like wattage. You know, you can do that in a VO2 max test. Not everyone's done that. So we got to have some knowns. Uh, and then they were trying to say like, well, if you don't have that, what else could you use? Um, and you know, at higher intensities, even that VO2 max data is kind of unreliable. So it's a really interesting study by Jeff uh, Rothschild, I think. Um, and as I was looking at that and I kind of shared it with you, um, I went on to my, I use intervals ICU for some of my own training programming and sure enough, like, what was it yesterday or two days ago, I look and that paper is already cited in intervals ICU and part of their, their, 
uh, sure. nature for, for athletes. It's on like their, their hub. And I was just blown away. I was like, wow, they're working fast. Like how are people supposed to keep up with, with this? Right. So um, I, I'll touch on that in a second, but then we had a, another paper that came out that I think was one of the first that have shown a, uh, uh, that your body weight actually can, uh, in part, determine how much carbohydrate you'll oxidize, which seems really intuitive, right? Like smaller person would probably be able to absorb and utilize less carbohydrate, bigger person, uh, right? Uh, but our recommendations have always been stated in, um, right, like 30 to 60, 60 to 90 grams of carbohydrate right. an hour, no consideration for body weight. And so now we have a paper that just came out like, hey, actually, like, um, no, like that might not actually be the case. Um, and so, I mean, just those two things alone, I think, are, are pretty, uh, pretty telling of where carbohydrate and nutrition uh, knowledge is going. It's going very detailed and very personalized. Uh, so there's a lot of really exciting things happening here. Yeah, yeah. And I think the, <laughs> the one good news about that, that second piece that you brought up um, of, you know, body size, you know, actually maybe having some bearing on the, the amount of carbohydrate you could oxidize mm-hmm. is, is that, you know, if you're a bigger person, you're doing more kilojoules, right? Like you're burning more energy. You have a higher threshold. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, you, yeah. The good news is, is that you can probably keep up with that better because y- you can yeah. actually oxidize more carbohydrate than, than the really small person. And it's, you know, I used to sort of speculate that, um, the reason why we don't see more, um, you know, just like big diesel riders in the Tour de France, for example, is that it's a fueling issue, right? If we're all capped at 90 grams an hour, you know, or, you know, I guess like you can oxidize one gram per minute of glucose, but, but you're a big guy and, and you're doing, you have a 500 watt FTP, like yeah, you're just never going to be able to keep up, right? Cause yeah. you're just going to get so far behind, but, but it seems like the research is, is kind of moving in the direction of like, no, okay, that's, that's not the case. So that's, that's cool. And I think that that's, that's good news. Um, so, you know, we brought up this kind of topic of, uh, you know, how much carbohydrate you can kind of oxidize per Mm -hmm. period of time. So let's say per hour. Right. So I think this is a good place to start talking about on bike fueling. Right. And so I, I think everybody will have, um, you know, kind of come to this podcast with already like a pretty good handle on this, but, you know, perhaps we can still provide some kind of nuance in, in maybe what's new or what's important, what doesn't matter, because there is a, a ton of marketing out there, right? You know, every everybody's gel is, is the best gel, right? Yeah. You know, whether it's hydrogel or it's isotonic or it has clustodextrin in it, you know, there, there are all these various things. So, you know, um, can we talk a little bit about, you know, what are kind of the important factors in getting the most out of your on-bike nutrition? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, it's, it's going to be determined on your need, right? So how uh, nuanced does this nutrition need to be? How scientific do we need to be? It, it's going to come down to uh, duration and intensity, right? Just the same way that carbohydrate volume is determined by that, or at least in part, uh, so too, our, our on the bike fueling will also be determined by that, right? So uh, typically, you'll hear the recommendations of like exercise below 90 minutes, probably don't need anything, maybe a carbohydrate mouth rinse because of sensors in our mouth connecting with our brain seems to give a little performance boost, right? So beyond 90 minutes, going up to two and a half hours, uh, we could probably go um, 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate an hour. Um, and then beyond two and a half hours, we're looking at uh, uh, not, you know, upwards of 90 grams of carbohydrate. That, that's changed in the sense that now we're seeing athletes take on, you know, 120 grams is like the new, that's the new normal. And then you're seeing athletes do, you know, 150, 180. You're seeing some pretty wow. crazy numbers up there. It's getting, it's like an arms race for carbohydrate usage, right? So um, how much should you actually take in uh, is going to be determined on intensity and duration. So uh, as we had mentioned, body size is, is part of this equation, right? Uh, duration, intensity, your FTP, right? Like what are those zones for you? How big is your engine? How much of this can you actually utilize, right? If I'm a right. bigger rider that can just, you know, crush some watts, 
I might be upward to that 120 gram an hour, but you know, if I'm, you know, five foot two female, 125 pounds, that might not be necessary, right? And right. even if you could, even if you could ingest that, you might not be actually using it all. So just because you can tolerate it doesn't mean it's eliciting benefit. So um, to try to find what's right for you, we have to take those variables into play. Um, in terms of like specifics of like when you're looking at a gel, I think one of the things I really want to look for with athletes is uh, a good glucose to fructose ratio. Um, glucose and fructose um, are types of carbohydrates. They go into different cell doors in the body. And so if we have too much of one and not enough of the other, we kind of make a traffic jam of sorts, right? They're not all, not all the carbohydrate can get in through that cell door. But if we have a good balance of the two, we're able to bring in more of that glucose and fructose. That clears the stomach and the intestines a little bit quicker. Uh, and then we can use it a little bit more expediently. So that ratios are really important. Um, typically, you'll see a two to one or a one to one ratio, something like that. I think the higher the amount of carbohydrate you're taking in on your ride, the more you want to try to get to a one to one or that uh, 0.8 to one glucose to fructose ratio. So the higher you go, the closer to singularity in those two you want to go. The lower you are right. in the scale, the less this matters. So that's, yeah. that's probably like one of the, the first things I think about when looking at products. Sure, sure. So like for these athletes that are really pushing uh, the limits, you know, like when Matthew Vanderpool's doing 120 grams mm -hmm. an hour, you know, very likely he's been very specific about, you know, getting those one to one or one to, to 0 0.08 ratio mm -hmm. gels, right? Mm -hmm. You know, because that's the only way he's going to get there. Um, and so I think something that's um, important for our listeners to understand um, is like the different types of, of carbohydrates that are going to be in these gels, right? So most of them do list fructose, but most of them are not going to just contain straight glucose. And I, I don't know why that is. It's almost always, you know, like some sort of polysaccharide. So uh, maltodextrin, is that fine? That's just, you know, I assume like a chain of, of glucose molecules and it's, it's kind of all the same for our use. Yeah, I, I think it, it can be really confusing, uh, even to me sometimes, but, uh, chemically that it's, that maltodextrin is going to be glucose, right? If you were to break down, what is that composed of? It's a hundred percent glucose. Um, so, yeah. so that's, that's, so you can go for just a maltodextrin fructose combo, like a lot of products do. And look at that and like, hey, is this two to one or one to one uh, or thereabouts? Perfect, right? Um, and again, like if I'm doing a two hour ride and I'm just, you know, whatever I'm taking in 45 grams an hour, this doesn't really matter that much. Like uh, yeah. there are a couple products out there that are not even going to list that ratio. Um, and those are, I think that's more appropriate for that below uh, below 90 and, and below 60 gram of carbohydrate an hour, if they're not listing the ratio, it's probably perfectly fine. Uh, probably not going to, you know, upset your stomach. Um, you know, there's that a lot of weight, a lot of different food products can work in that. Uh, but it seems more and more now, like there's probably five or six companies out there that are crushing it. They've got like, they've got the science down, right? We're looking for, you know, maybe a hundred to 200 milligrams of sodium we want zero fiber. We want this two to one or one to one ratio of glucose to fructose. Athletes either want 30, 40, or 50 grams of carbohydrate an hour. Here's your flavors. Take your pick. Sweet. Yeah. And so, so you mentioned like, okay, so in whatever we're doing, let's say we don't need to be doing that full 90 grams an hour mm -hmm. of carbohydrate. So the ratio doesn't matter as much. And so that I think it sounds like it opens us up to a much bigger variety of choices. Right. And so mm -hmm. one of my questions for you is, um, you know, if, if you're in the gas station, if you're doing Unbun XL mm -hmm. and you need carbohydrates cause you didn't carry, you know, 40 Morton gels, you know, what's, what's a good option? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, one of my go-tos is probably going to be like fig Newtons and airheads. Um, airheads are there, I think they're 15 grams of carbohydrate per and like, they, you can fit a million of them in your pocket. Like they're perfectly like pocket size. Uh, Big Newtons are 40 grams or 42 grams of carbohydrate per serving. Uh, they're what, two or three bites, minimal fiber. And I've got to imagine we've got fig, right? I've got some fructose source. I've got the, like, the cookie surrounding it. So I've got starch. So 
my mind goes like, okay, pretty good option. But um, even your corn syrup or normal sugar-based uh, gummies can also work. Uh, most of those are going to be a 45 to 55 combo or a 50-50 combo of uh, glucose and fructose as well. So that can also work in that. But of, of course, we've <laughs> I've seen Unbound XL athletes just uh, pizza and chocolate milk, and then they keep on trucking. Um, some of that's also just mentally, they're just like, I can't do another gel. So sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and you, I think mentioned earlier, like food can bring us happiness, right? So there are situations where, where maybe, you know, eating goes beyond just fueling. So I know we've, we've kind of set forth this sort of, um, you know, food is fuel sort of framework in this podcast episode, but I think it's, it's important to not lose sight of, uh, you know, the psychological benefits of various foods, but, um, to, to go back to the gas station candy thing for one second, it, it initially kind of my thought was like, okay, these are, gr- these are your great options mm-hmm. if you don't need to be so concerned about the ratio. But, but if you can determine that like, let's say Haribo gummy bear, for example, is, you know, 50, 50, right. Of, of sort of like glucose to fructose. Yeah. May, maybe doing 90 grams an hour of, of gummy bears is the ticket. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it could work. It, it really depends on your, on your, uh, sensitivities in your stomach. Um, you know, some of those things they're, uh, the, they can really pull in a good bit of water into the stomach. Um, so we, we have to make sure we're staying hydrated when we're drinking them. Uh, maybe not taking them all at once. <laughs> sure. Also be recommended. Uh, so it, it's not, it, it's not to say that you have carte blanche to like anything in the gas station goes and nothing bad will happen below 90 grams an hour. Um, sure. Some of these food products are also coming with fat, fiber, protein, things that slow digestion could cause bloating, cramping, um, or just hurt our stomach during exercise. So we do have to be mindful with that stuff. But again, the lower the intensity of the exercise, um, the more you're going to be able to kind of get away with. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you brought up the concept of, um, you know, a food product or, you know, like a certain gel bringing more water into the gut. So, um, yeah. Like what are your thoughts on the importance of, of going with like only isotonic gels, for example, Mm -hmm. right? Like, is that, is that something that you think really makes a difference or as long as we're hydrating, does it, does it not maybe matter too much? I can't imagine that it matters if you're, if you're, if you're able to stay hydrated and, you know, fluid is not at a premium for you. I think context in which this could make sense to have a more concentrated gel could be, I'm relying on aid stations more. So I'm stopping getting more fluids. I, there's no scarcity in water. Um, I could think maybe also like some ultra runners or uh, even those doing marathons, like, hey, each mile I'm getting, you know, I'm getting my own fluids here, but I'm carrying with me my own particular gels. So right. why bring the extra water when I'm going to pick it up at the aid station? So there's, there's different strategies around that. Um, depending on like, Hey, like how much space do I have to store versus how much water am I able to carry with me? Um, sure. but I, I wouldn't imagine it would matter if you're able to stay hydrated and you're drinking, uh, along with, uh, each serving. So, so then would you say that the inverse is true in a scenario where water is scarce? Like maybe you're racing your first mm-hmm. unbound, for example, you're, you're carrying, you know, one liter bottles of water and you have your, your used to be hydration pack on so that you don't have to stop, but you're also needing to be sort of judicious with your water. Um, is that a scenario where like, or maybe you're, you know, you're racing mountain bikes, right. And it's hard to take your hands off the bars. Is that a scenario where you think maybe the isotonic gel is kind of maybe a more critical piece of, of that nutrition plan? Yeah, I think so. Um, Because on the one end, you know, it might be hard for you to to get that sip of water. And, you know, you've got one shot to kind of get this gel, squeeze it and be be done. Um, uh, And also like, yeah, I might want to carry a little more water with me. Uh, And so if I'm taking, you know, four gels an hour, I'm trying to like hit, you know, 120 grams uh, an hour and I'm having 60 milliliter gels, right? That's a a decent, that's a contribution. Like that's definitely helping my hydration. Right. Then you're weighing out the this is where you get into like all the fun. Like there's a weight penalty for that. For that matter. Sure. You get, yeah. You get a little nerdy with it. But yeah, I think if, if you're not able to uh, take adequate water with that or you think like I might run out of my bo- I might run out of water in my bottle before I run out of food. It's a situation in which uh, an isotonic gel would be a really good idea. Yeah. Yeah. And so real, real quick before we we kind of close out here, one thing I did want to bring up is um 
yeah, really, really pay attention to these, these ratios. If you're going to try and go to kind of the upper limits, like if you're racing and you're really wanting to do everything you can, you're, you're putting out a lot of Watts for a long time and you want to hit that 90 grams an hour. Um, because you know, one gel that comes to mind that I, I, I'd never realized this until, you know, recently is the SIS gels. Mm -hmm. Um, if I'm not mistaken, they, they don't have any fructose in them. It's just, I think it's just malto. It's just malto Yep, yep, yep. The isotonic ones. Yeah, there, it's yeah. 22 grams of carbohydrate and it's all essentially malto dextrin, which is why they're $1. And like, yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's a little cheaper and that's not a knock on SIS because, you know, they do make good products. They have their beta fuel, which sure. does have that uh, 0.8 to 1 ratio. Um, but yeah, it's, that's that's only malt deduction. So these those ratios matter. What you choose matters. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. And I, I bring it up and this really kind of stood out to me when I found that out is because for years and years, I, I loved those gels. Yeah. Like the tutti, the tutti frutti flavor of the mm. SIS, <laughs> you know, non beta fuel gel. Yeah, there was there was tons of races throughout my career where my plan was that I was going to eat, you know, three or four of those an hour, right? You yeah. know, and I was aiming for that ninety grams, and uh, yeah, I don't remember whether or not my stomach got upset, like if I didn't tolerate that that incorrect ratio, or if yeah. it just didn't end up getting oxidized. But either way, I'm I'm upset, so <laughs> I'm gonna have to <laughs> figure something else out. Um, well, sweet, Alex. Um, I've taken up a lot of your time, but I, I really appreciate you coming on today. And uh, really? I, I definitely learned a lot. So if, if people want to get in touch with you or work with you, um, you know, where can they find you? Yeah. So uh, I have a, a remote private practice I mentioned earlier, Second Arrow Nutrition Consulting. Uh, so you can find me at secondarrownutrition.com. Um, my email is secondarrownutrition at gmail. Um, so I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, I should also be second arrow underscore nutrition on Instagram. Uh, so you can, you know, send me an email, a DM. Uh, there's also a contact form on my website. So if you're interested um, in working with a sports dietitian such as myself, uh, you can go to secondarrownutrition.com and uh, scroll down and there is a contact form uh, for coaching inquiries. Um, and yeah, I'm taking plenty of athletes right now in preparation for the new year, trying to help people, uh, make the most out of their health and performance and you know, kind of do away with some of the frivolous new year's goals and, and get into some real stuff. Yeah, man, that sounds good. And, and real quick, before I close out here, I want to give a special shout out to Alex's uh, Instagram page because he has done some phenomenal uh, and stylish infographics on, oh, on some you. of these topics. So, you know, if, if you listen to this podcast and we were just, you know, two in the weeds and maybe it made your head spin, you know, head over to Alex's Instagram page, give him a like, you know, and have a look at some of those infographics that really, I think, help to kind of break down um, what we're talking about here, or maybe you're just a, a more visual learner. Um, I think that those are fantastic. Uh, another person that I'll, I'll kind of shout out that we've mentioned already is, is Asker Yukendrup, who has also a very good Instagram page that is full of very easy to understand infographics that summarize a lot of this information. So, I think those are two really great sources for, for people who are interested in, in either clarifying, you know, what they heard today or just want to learn more and stay up to date. Um, and with that, thank you listeners. Thank you, Alex. Uh, have a great night. <laughs> Much appreciated. Thanks. Bye.